This presentation on official reviews is geared not only towards head referees, who by the nature of their position do a lot of leading in reviews, but also to the other officials involved. Official reviews are something that we see a lot of, but I haven't seen a whole lot on how to run them. This is my modest attempt to change that. The goal of this presentation is simple to help provide a structure for the officiating crew to be able to communicate effectively and efficiently with each other and for the head referee to do the same when communicating to the captains. The execution, however, can be difficult and it takes time, planning, and discipline in order to pull it off well. This presentation is going to be a bit different than most of the other modules on RefEd.com because it's geared more towards the process rather than the rules. Since an official review could cover any number of issues and rules, we're going to focus instead on how to do a review well from start to finish, rather than how the actual decision is made. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on RefEd.com. The date of this recording is January 4, 2015, and there have been no updates since the original presentation was released. So, let's start with what the official review is. The official review is a formal request by a team's captain or assistant captain to have all officials stop, concentrate on the same issue they're disputing, and honestly decide if we made a mistake or not. And if we did make a mistake, correct it as far as the rules will allow us to do. Different head referees will do different things, but if you've watched enough roller derby, you'll know it's pretty common for captains and assistant captains to ask questions between jams. Speaking for myself, I tell the participants in a captain's meeting that if I have issues to take care of in the 30 seconds between jams, I may not be able to talk to them. But if they're so inclined, they're welcome to take a time out and then they can have me for all 60 seconds if they wish. Likewise, if they have an official review, they can bring up their issue to the entire referee crew. Think of it this way. If a captain and I'm just going to combine the captain and assistant together from now on, unless I need to specifically separate the positions. If a captain asks for something in the 30 seconds between jams, it needs to be a quick fix. Pretty much a, oh crap, I forgot something moment. Did the jam ref remember the not on the track point? Followed by, yes, I remembered, or, oh crap, I'll correct it. Anything more detailed is going to require a review. So a captain has called for an official review. Now what? First, all the referees need to get together. Forget about getting water for now. There will be other stoppages. And nothing is more unprofessional than having to be herded in like a lost puppy for an official review. It shows that you weren't paying attention. If you absolutely need to be somewhere else, say you're a jammer referee and there's a possible scoring issue and you need to talk to the scorekeeper, tell the head ref about it immediately before the review starts. If the review is about something you're about to correct on your own, the captain should know that and the review can and should be refunded. What happens next depends on the head referee. Currently, there are two schools of thought about how the head ref listens to reviews. One school is that the captains and the head ref and only the head ref get together. The captains say what they want reviewed, and then the head ref relays it to the crew away from the captains. I've heard multiple reasons for this. One is that it lowers the intimidation factor. The captains aren't staring down seven referees. They're only talking to the head referee. 
It can also allow the head referee to better understand the situation before bringing it to the officials. The second school is that all the officials come together and listen in on the request as a group. The idea behind this is that sometimes things get lost in translation. Anyone play telephone as a kid? And this way, everyone gets exactly what the captain wants to hear, although it does lose the personal touch of the other method. If you're a referee and your official reviews are done in this manner, do not interject or try to explain your call while the captains are there, assuming it's your call that's being reviewed. Interactions between the head ref and the captains sometimes have to be carefully managed, and no matter how well intended, it's really easy for these types of things to get out of control. When we get to how to talk to captains, I'll explain why. As to the type of review, there is no right or wrong answer. Both types have their merits. I think it has more to do with how the head referee interacts with his or her crew and the captains more than anything. I won't even say what method I use because, honestly, I couldn't say if my way is better than anyone else's. Once the issue that the captain wants reviewed has been stated, and if you're doing a group listen to the review once you've moved away from the captains, one thing needs to happen immediately. If the issue being reviewed does not involve you, for example, you're an outside pack ref on the opposite side of the track from the requested incident, simply tell the head ref that you didn't see it, quickly, and leave. The most common phrase I've heard is, I had no eyes on it. If you're not involved in the review at that point, it's now your job to keep an eye on the benches, skaters on the track, and skaters in the penalty box. I really like spots on the safety lane outside of the benches. It gives you a single view of everyone involved. Even if you're the only one watching, it lets you watch without turning your head back and forth like a security camera. If you are in the review, Be as accurate and efficient with your language as possible. Remember that one of the biggest complaints about roller derby is the length of official timeouts. Not only for fans, but for skaters, as extended timeouts cools them down. Here's an example of a review where I was a jam ref, and the review was asking for a back block call that I did not make. The block was on a legal target zone, not on the back, but on the back half of the side. Following that, one of the outside pack refs added, I saw it and agree with that description. The inside pack ref also added, as do I. Here's the thing. Don't get bogged down in the details. If you agree with a call, say so. You don't need to get much more detailed than that. If you don't, say so just as tersely as the first statement, such as, from my position, it looked like the jammer got her square in the back. All of this, including the numbers of refs seeing the incident, is important because the head referee has to relay the decision back to the captains. This is almost always done by the head referee and the head referee alone. If you're not the head ref and you made the call, you won't be doing any favors by hanging around. As soon as the decision is made, go to your positions. For the head referee, especially if he or she is going to render a verdict contrary to what the captains emphatically want, this can be a delicate process. This is how I handle my reviews. This is by no means the only method, but this is something that I have found works for me. First, before I talk to the captains, I formulate exactly what I'm going to say to them. If this means I keep the refs together for a few moments longer so I can prepare my statement, so be it. Very often, I see head refs go to give their decision, and then it becomes another review by proxy, where the captains try to re-argue their point, and the head referee lets them do it. My goal is to lay things out to the captains in such a way where the most they can do is simply say, I disagree with your decision, and then move on. This is my formula. Initially, I state how many referees saw the incident. If a referee was not in a good position to see the incident accurately they don't count. Just like you don't make a call if you're not sure about it, you don't weigh in on a review unless you're sure as well. Second, explain what they saw. Third, cite any rules that apply in these situations. 
Finally, end by saying that the call will be overturned or will stand and if the review is retained. Here's an example. Say a captain calls a review and is asking that the opposing jammer be given a cutting the track penalty. She was blocked down and the captain saw the jammer's foot go over the boundary line out of bounds. She then got up in front of the blocker that knocked her out of bounds. Here's my possible reply. I talked to my crew and we have three referees who saw the incident. The jammer referee and two outside pack refs. All three agree that while the jammer's foot went past the boundary line, no part of her body actually touched out of bounds. Because she never touched out of bounds, she is still technically in bounds, just like if someone jumped the apex. Therefore, the no call will stand and the review is not retained. At this point, the captain has three options. Say okay and leave, disagree and leave, or argue that she saw the jammer's foot touch out of bounds. In which case, the only reply I can give as the head referee is that, like I said before, none of our referees saw it touch out of bounds, and therefore we still can't call it. If the captains are still angry after this and still want to talk, you need to be calm, look them in the eyes, with respect, not anger, nod and tell them that you understand why they feel that way, but you're required to make a decision, and the decision was made. Let them have the last word. Being argumentative does nobody any good and only demeans your authority. Be polite, be firm, and be respectful. And then tell the jam timer to start things up and go to your position. If they still want to talk, advise them that they will need to take a timeout to do so. In the end, as long as they don't cross the line to misconduct or insubordination, let them vent. And even if they do cross that line, stay polite and stay calm as you issue that penalty. Remember, even if you have to toss them, there are plenty of other people on that team that you will have to deal with. And if you look like you don't have control, your game will go to hell. There are times, of course, when you can't back up a call with multiple referees. It can be awkward, but nobody said that being a head referee was easy. If I took the same review as before, I might phrase my report back to the captains thusly. The only person on my crew who had eyes on it was my jammer referee. The outside pack refs and inside pack ref did not have a clear enough view to make a call. The jam referee saw the foot go over the boundary line, but did not touch the floor beyond the boundary line, which means she technically was never out of bounds. Therefore, the no call stands, and you do not retain your review. In this case, I don't want to throw any of the referees under the bus, and if I'm asked about it, I may relay what the other officials were looking at, or if their view was obscured by another blocker but ultimately, I want to be accurate. While it's nice to be able to back up calls, ultimately we have to stick with what we see. And if only one referee sees it, then only one referee can make that call. However, there are times when sometimes you just have to admit things get missed. I had a review where the captain asked that a jammer cut get removed, saying that the blocker who knocked her out of bounds also went out of bounds. In this situation, it happened at the very back of the engagement zone. The jammer was at high speed, barely touched out of bounds, and the jammer referee called the cut. In this case, the captain said the blocker stumbled after the block before going out of bounds, taking a second or two before it actually happened. Keep in mind that good skaters can clear a lap in eight seconds, so a slow developing play like this is something that a jammer referee may not be able to see it would be up to the inside and outside pack refs to see if it happened or not, and nobody knew if she went out of bounds or not. This is what I told the captain. This is the kind of thing I hate to bring up as a head referee, but unfortunately you get to hear it. Simply put, we didn't have anyone who saw what you said. The jammer referee was too far in front to see if the blocker went out of bounds, and the rest of us didn't follow the blocker following the jammer referee's cut call. You may be completely correct, but unfortunately, because none of us saw it, I can't uphold your review, and the cut call has to stand. 
that report is a total mea culpa. We as a crew, and me personally, since I was the backpack ref, totally missed it. And while you don't want to make a habit of admitting mistakes, you also need to be honest about it. And while we're on mistakes, I don't consider having a call overturned as a mistake. In my last example, the mistake was nobody covering a portion of the track that we should have been watching. If a review overturns a call, it's our way of being correct, just a little bit after the fact. Ideally, we'd get everything right every time, and any little mistake, which would never happen, would be communicated immediately during the jam, and nobody would ever boo at refs, and we'd never need official reviews. But that's not reality. And even sometimes in reality, we need to overturn calls. Remember, the referees are a team. And if another member of our team has a better angle on a call, let them have it. It's worth noting for later to see if there's a way to get it communicated quicker or called correctly the first time. But nobody should ever leave an official review feeling bad their call was changed. This really isn't a refereeing 101 type topic, so I'm not going to go over all the technical details of the official review. If you're the head referee, you should have enough of a grasp of the rules to understand points awarded or not awarded in error, as well as the other technical details of the review. But if you are the head referee, or even if you're not the head referee, I do hope that this presentation does help you deal with official reviews in a more efficient and effective way. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. I'd also like to thank the following photographers who gave me permission to use their photos. Pre-Flash Gordon, James McDaniel, and Doff Lensgren. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site, but please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.